Herbert Spencer was an English philosopher, biologist, anthropologist, sociologist, and prominent classical liberal political theorist of the Victorian era. Spencer developed an all-embracing conception of evolution as the progressive development of the physical world, biological organisms, the human mind, and human culture and societies. He was an enthusiastic exponent of evolution, and even wrote about evolution before Darwin did. As a polymath, he contributed to a wide range of subjects, including ethics, religion, anthropology, economics, political theory, philosophy, literature, biology, sociology, and psychology. During his lifetime he achieved tremendous authority, mainly in English-speaking academia. The only other English philosopher to have achieved anything like such widespread popularity was Bertrand Russell, and that was in the 20th century. Spencer was the single most famous European intellectual in the closing decades of the 19th century, but his influence declined sharply after 1900. Who now reads Spencer? asked Talsot Parsons in 1937. Spencer is best known for coining the expression survival of the fittest, which he did in Principles of Biology, after reading Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. This term strongly suggests natural selection, yet as Spencer extended evolution into realms of sociology and ethics, he also made use of Lamarckism. Life Herbert Spencer was born in Derby, England, on April 27, 1820, the son of William George Spencer. Spencer's father was a religious dissenter who drifted from Methodism to Quakerism, and who seems to have transmitted to his son an opposition to all forms of authority. He ran a school founded on the progressive teaching methods of Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi and also served as secretary of the Derby Philosophical Society, a scientific society which had been founded in the 1790s by Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin. Spencer was educated in empirical science by his father, while the members of the Derby Philosophical Society introduced him to pre-Darwinian concepts of biological evolution, particularly those of Erasmus Darwin and Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. His uncle, the Reverend Thomas Spencer, vicar of Hinton Charter House near Bath, completed Spencer's limited formal education by teaching him some mathematics and physics, and enough Latin to enable him to translate some easy texts. Thomas Spencer also imprinted on his nephew his own firm free trade and anti-statist political views. Otherwise, Spencer was an autodidact who acquired most of his knowledge from narrowly focused readings and conversations with his friends and acquaintances. As both an adolescent and a young man Spencer found it difficult to settle to any intellectual or professional discipline. He worked as a civil engineer during the railway boom of the late 1830s, while also devoting much of his time to writing for provincial journals that were nonconformist in their religion and radical in their politics. From 1848 to 1853 he served as sub-editor on the free trade journal The Economist, during which time he published his first book, Social Statics, which predicted that humanity would eventually become completely adapted to the requirements of living in society with a consequential withering away of the state. Its publisher, John Chapman, introduced Spencer to his salon which was attended by many of the leading radical and progressive thinkers of the capital, including John Stuart Mill, Harriet Martineau, George Henry Lewis and Mary Ann Evans, with whom he was briefly romantically linked. Spencer himself introduced the biologist Thomas Henry Huxley, who would later win fame as Darwin's bulldog and who remained his lifelong friend. However it was the friendship of Evans and Lewis that acquainted him with John Stuart Mill's A System of Logic and with Auguste Comte's positivism and which set him on the road to his life's work. He strongly disagreed with Comte. The first fruit of his friendship with Evans and Lewis was Spencer's second book, Principles of Psychology, published in 1855, which explored a physiological basis for psychology. The book was founded on the fundamental assumption that the human mind was subject to natural laws and that these could be discovered within the framework of general biology. This permitted the adoption of a developmental perspective not merely in terms of the individual, but also of the species and the race. Through this paradigm, Spencer aimed to reconcile the associationist psychology of Mill's logic, the notion that human mind was constructed from atomic sensations held together by the laws of the association of ideas, 
with the apparently more scientific theory of phrenology, which located specific mental functions in specific parts of the brain. Spencer argued that both these theories were partial accounts of the truth, repeated associations of ideas were embodied in the formation of specific strands of brain tissue, and these could be passed from one generation to the next by means of the Lamarckian mechanism of use inheritance. The psychology, he believed, would do for the human mind what Isaac Newton had done for matter. However, the book was not initially successful and the last of the 251 copies of its first edition was not sold until June 1861. Spencer's interest in psychology derived from a more fundamental concern which was to establish the universality of natural law. In common with others of his generation, including the members of Chapman's Salon, he was possessed with the idea of demonstrating that it was possible to show that everything in the universe a euro including human culture, language, and morality a euro could be explained by laws of universal validity. This was in contrast to the views of many theologians of the time who insisted that some parts of creation, in particular the human soul, were beyond the realm of scientific investigation. Comte's Systeme de Philosophie Positive had been written with the ambition of demonstrating the universality of natural law, and Spencer was to follow Comte in the scale of his ambition. However, Spencer differed from Comte in believing it was possible to discover a single law of universal application which he identified with progressive development and was to call the principle of evolution. In 1858 Spencer produced an outline of what was to become the system of synthetic philosophy. This immense undertaking, which has few parallels in the English language, aimed to demonstrate that the principle of evolution applied in biology, psychology, sociology and morality. Spencer envisaged that this work of ten volumes would take twenty years to complete. In the end it took him twice as long and consumed almost all the rest of his long life. Despite Spencer's early struggles to establish himself as a writer, by the 1870s he had become the most famous philosopher of the age. His works were widely read during his lifetime, and by 1869 he was able to support himself solely on the profit of book sales and on income from his regular contributions to Victorian periodicals which were collected as three volumes of essays. His works were translated into German, Italian, Spanish, French, Russian, Japanese and Chinese and into many other languages and he was offered honors and awards all over Europe and North America. He also became a member of the Athenaeum, an exclusive gentleman's club in London open only to those distinguished in the arts and sciences, and the X Club, a dining club of nine founded by T. H. Huxley that met every month and included some of the most prominent thinkers of the Victorian age. Members included physicist philosopher John Tyndall and Darwin's cousin, the banker and biologist Sir John Lubbock. There were also some quite significant satellites such as liberal clergyman Arthur Stanley, the Dean of Westminster. And guests such as Charles Darwin and Hermann von Helmholtz were entertained from time to time. Through such associations, Spencer had a strong presence in the heart of the scientific community and was able to secure an influential audience for his views. Despite his growing wealth and fame he never owned a house of his own. The last decades of Spencer's life were characterized by growing disillusionment and loneliness. He never married, and after 1855 was a perpetual hypochondriac who complained endlessly of pains and maladies that no physician could diagnose. By the 1890s his readership had begun to desert him while many of his closest friends died and he had come to doubt the confident faith in progress that he had made the centerpiece of his philosophical system. His later years were also ones in which his political views became increasingly conservative. Whereas social statics had been the work of a radical Democrat who believed in votes for women and in the nationalization of the land to break the power of the aristocracy, by the 1880s he had become a staunch opponent of female suffrage and made common cause with the landowners of the Liberty and Property Defense League against what they saw as the drift towards socialism of elements within the administration of William Award Gladstone a euro largely against the opinions of Gladstone himself. Spencer's political views from this period were expressed in what has become his most famous work, The Man vs. the State. The exception to Spencer's growing conservatism was that he remained throughout his life an ardent opponent of imperialism and militarism. His critique of the Boer War was especially scathing, 
and it contributed to his declining popularity in Britain. Spencer also invented a precursor to the modern paper clip, though it looked more like a modern copper pin. This binding pin was distributed by Ackerman and Company. Spencer shows drawings of the pin in Appendix I of his autobiography along with published descriptions of its uses. In 1902, shortly before his death, Spencer was nominated for the Nobel Prize for Literature. He continued writing all his life, in later years often by dictation, until he succumbed to poor health at the age of 83. His ashes are interred in the eastern side of London's Highgate Cemetery facing Karl Marx's grave. At Spencer's funeral the Indian nationalist leader Shyamji Krishnavarma announced a donation of a £1,000 to establish a lectureship at Oxford University in tribute to Spencer and his work. Synthetic philosophy, the basis for Spencer's appeal to many of his generation was that he appeared to offer a ready-made system of belief which could substitute for conventional religious faith at a time when orthodox creeds were crumbling under the advances of modern science. Spencer's philosophical systems seemed to demonstrate that it was possible to believe in the ultimate perfection of humanity on the basis of advanced scientific conceptions such as the first law of thermodynamics and biological evolution. In essence Spencer's philosophical vision was formed by a combination of deism and positivism. On the one hand, he had imbibed something of 18th century deism from his father and other members of the Derby Philosophical Society and from books like George Coombe's immensely popular The Constitution of Man. This treated the world as a cosmos of benevolent design, and the laws of nature as the decrees of a being transcendentally kind. Natural laws were thus the statutes of a well-governed universe that had been decreed by the Creator with the intention of promoting human happiness. Although Spencer lost his Christian faith as a teenager and later rejected any anthropomorphic conception of the deity, he nonetheless held fast to this conception at an almost subconscious level. At the same time, however, he owed far more than he would ever acknowledge to positivism, in particular in its conception of a philosophical system as the unification of the various branches of scientific knowledge. He also followed positivism in his insistence that it was only possible to have genuine knowledge of phenomena and hence that it was idle to speculate about the nature of the ultimate reality. The tension between positivism and his residual deism ran through the entire system of synthetic philosophy. Spencer followed Kant in aiming for the unification of scientific truth. It was in this sense that his philosophy aimed to be synthetic. Like Kant, he was committed to the universality of natural law the idea that the laws of nature applied without exception, to the organic realm as much as to the inorganic, and to the human mind as much as to the rest of creation. The first objective of the synthetic philosophy was thus to demonstrate that there were no exceptions to being able to discover scientific explanations, in the form of natural laws, of all the phenomena of the universe. Spencer's volumes on biology, psychology, and sociology were all intended to demonstrate the existence of natural laws in these specific disciplines. Even in his writings on ethics, he held that it was possible to discover laws of morality that had the status of laws of nature while still having normative content, a conception which can be traced to Coombe's constitution of man. The second objective of the synthetic philosophy was to show that these same laws led inexorably to progress. In contrast to Comte, who stressed only the unity of scientific method, Spencer sought the unification of scientific knowledge in the form of the reduction of all natural laws to one fundamental law, the law of evolution. In this respect, he followed the model laid down by the Edinburgh publisher Robert Chambers in his anonymous Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. Although often dismissed as a lightweight forerunner of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, Chambers' book was in reality a program for the unification of science which aimed to show that Laplace's nebula hypothesis for the origin of the solar system and Lamarck's theory of species transformation were both instances of one magnificent generalization of progressive development. Chambers was associated with Chapman's salon and his work served as the unacknowledged template for the synthetic philosophy. Evolution Spencer first articulated his evolutionary perspective in his essay, Progress, Its Law and Cause, published in Chapman's Westminster Review in 1857, and which later formed the basis of the first principles of a new system of philosophy. 
In it he expounded a theory of evolution which combined insights from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's essay The Theory of Life a Euro itself derivative from Friedrich von Schelling's Natur philosophy a Euro with the generalization of von Baer's law of embryological development. Spencer posited that all structures in the universe develop from a simple, undifferentiated, homogeneity to a complex, differentiated, heterogeneity, while being accompanied by a process of greater integration of the differentiated parts. This evolutionary process could be found at work, Spencer believed, throughout the cosmos. It was a universal law, that was applying to the stars and the galaxies as much as to biological organisms, and to human social organization as much as to the human mind. It differed from other scientific laws only by its greater generality, and the laws of the special sciences could be shown to be illustrations of this principle. However, as Bertrand Russell stated in a letter to Beatrice Webb in 1923, this formulation has problems. I don't know whether Spencer was ever made to realize the implications of the second law of thermodynamics. If so, he may well be upset. The law says that everything tends to uniformity and a dead level, diminishing heterogeneity. As an objection to evolution, this case is still regularly made by anti-evolutionists but does not apply to Darwinian approaches. It is applicable to matter and energy, not complex social systems. Spencer's attempt to explain the evolution of complexity was radically different from that to be found in Darwin's Origin of Species which was published two years later. Spencer is often, quite erroneously, believed to have merely appropriated and generalized Darwin's work on natural selection. But although after reading Darwin's work he coined the phrase survival of the fittest as his own term for Darwin's concept, and is often misrepresented as a thinker who merely applied the Darwinian theory to society, he only grudgingly incorporated natural selection into his pre-existing overall system. The primary mechanism of species transformation that he recognized was Lamarckian use inheritance which posited that organs are developed or are diminished by use or disuse and that the resulting changes may be transmitted to future generations. Spencer believed that this evolutionary mechanism was also necessary to explain higher evolution, especially the social development of humanity. Moreover, in contrast to Darwin, he held that evolution had a direction and an end point the attainment of a final state of equilibrium. He tried to apply the theory of biological evolution to sociology. He proposed that society was the product of change from lower to higher forms, just as in the theory of biological evolution, the lowest forms of life are said to be evolving into higher forms. Spencer claimed that man's mind had evolved in the same way from the simple automatic responses of lower animals to the process of reasoning in the thinking man. Spencer believed in two kinds of knowledge, knowledge gained by the individual and knowledge gained by the race. Intuition, or knowledge learned unconsciously, was the inherited experience of the race. Sociology Spencer read with excitement the original positivist sociology of Auguste Comte. A philosopher of science, Comte had proposed a theory of Soki cultural evolution that society progresses by a general law of three stages. Writing after various developments in biology, however, Spencer rejected what he regarded as the ideological aspects of Comte's positivism, attempting to reformulate social science in terms of evolutionary biology. One might broadly describe Spencer's sociology as socially Darwinistic. The evolutionary progression from simple, undifferentiated homogeneity to complex, differentiated heterogeneity was exemplified, Spencer argued by the development of society. He developed a theory of two types of society, the militant and the industrial, which corresponded to this evolutionary progression. Militant society, structured around relationships of hierarchy and obedience, was simple and undifferentiated. Industrial society, based on voluntary, contractually assumed social obligations, was complex and differentiated. Society which Spencer conceptualized as a social organism evolved from the simpler state to the more complex according to the universal law of evolution. Moreover, industrial society was the direct descendant of the ideal society developed in social statics, although Spencer now equivocated over whether the evolution of society would result in anarchism or whether it pointed to a continued role for the state, 
albeit one reduced to the minimal functions of the enforcement of contracts and external defense. Though Spencer made some valuable contributions to early sociology, not least in his influence on structural functionalism, his attempt to introduce Lamarckian or Darwinian ideas into the realm of sociology was unsuccessful. It was considered by many, furthermore, to be actively dangerous. Hermeneuticians of the period, such as Wilhelm Dilly, would pioneer the distinction between the natural sciences and human sciences. In the United States, the sociologist Lester Frank Ward, who would be elected as the first president of the American Sociological Association, launched a relentless attack on Spencer's theories of laissez-faire and political ethics. Although Ward admired much of Spencer's work he believed that Spencer's prior political biases had distorted his thought and had led him astray. In the 1890s, a Permel Mild Urquheim established formal academic sociology with a firm emphasis on practical social research. By the turn of the 20th century the first generation of German sociologists, most notably Max Weber, had presented methodological antipositivism. However, it should be noted that Spencer's theories of laissez-faire, survival of the fittest and minimal human interference in the processes of natural law had an enduring and even increasing appeal in the social science fields of economics and political science. Agnosticism Spencer's reputation among the Victorians owed a great deal to his agnosticism. He rejected theology as representing the impiety of the pious. He was to gain much notoriety from his repudiation of traditional religion, and was frequently condemned by religious thinkers for allegedly advocating atheism and materialism. Nonetheless, unlike Thomas Henry Huxley, whose agnosticism was a militant creed directed at the unpardonable sin of faith, Spencer insisted that he was not concerned to undermine religion in the name of science, but to bring about a reconciliation of the two. Starting either from religious belief or from science, Spencer argued, we are ultimately driven to accept certain indispensable but literally inconceivable notions. Whether we are concerned with the creator or the substratum which underlies our experience of phenomena, we can frame no conception of it. Therefore, Spencer concluded, Religion and science agree in the supreme truth that the human understanding is only capable of relative knowledge. This is the case since, owing to the inherent limitations of the human mind, it is only possible to obtain knowledge of phenomena, not of the reality underlying phenomena. Hence both science and religion must come to recognize as the most certain of all facts that the power which the universe manifests to us is utterly inscrutable. He called this awareness of the unknowable and he presented worship of the unknowable as capable of being a positive faith which could substitute for conventional religion. Indeed, he thought that the unknowable represented the ultimate stage in the evolution of religion, the final elimination of its last anthropomorphic vestiges. Political views Spencerian views in 21st century circulation derive from his political theories and memorable attacks on the reform movements of the late 19th century. He has been claimed as a precursor by libertarians and anarcho-capitalists. Economist Murray Rothbard called social statics the greatest single work of libertarian political philosophy ever written. Spencer argued that the state was not an essential institution and that it would decay as voluntary market organization would replace the coercive aspects of the state. He also argued that the individual had a right to ignore the state. As a result of this perspective, Spencer was harshly critical of patriotism. In response to being told that British troops were in danger during the Second Afghan War, he replied, when men hire themselves out to shoot other men to order, asking nothing about the justice of their cause, I don't care if they are shot themselves. Politics in late Victorian Britain moved in directions that Spencer disliked, and his arguments provided much ammunition for conservatives and individualists in Europe and America that they still are in use in the 21st century. The expression there is no alternative, made famous by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, may be traced to its emphatic use by Spencer. By the 1880s he was denouncing the new Toryism. In The Man vs. the State, he attacked Gladstone and the Liberal Party for losing its proper mission and instead promoting paternalist social legislation. Spencer denounced Irish land reform, compulsory education, laws to regulate safety at work, prohibition and temperance laws, tax-funded libraries, 
and welfare reforms. His main objections were threefold, the use of the coercive powers of the government, the discouragement given to voluntary self-improvement, and the disregard of the laws of life. The reforms, he said, were tantamount to socialism, which he said was about the same as slavery in terms of limiting human freedom. Spencer vehemently attacked the widespread enthusiasm for annexation of colonies and imperial expansion, which subverted all he had predicted about evolutionary progress from militant to industrial societies and states. Spencer anticipated many of the analytical standpoints of later libertarian theorists such as Friedrich Hayek, especially in his Law of Equal Liberty, his insistence on the limits to predictive knowledge, his model of a spontaneous social order, and his warnings about the unintended consequences of collectivist social reforms. While often caricatured as ultra-conservative, Spencer had been more radical earlier in his career a Euro opposing private property in land and claiming that each person has a latent claim to participate in the use of the earth, calling himself a radical feminist, and advocating the organization of trade unions as a bulwark against exploitation by bosses, and favored an economy organized primarily in free worker cooperatives as a replacement for wage labor. Although he retained support for unions, his views on the other issues had changed by the 1880s. He came to predict that that social welfare programs would eventually lead to socialization of the means of production, saying all socialism is slavery. Spencer defined a slave as a person who labors under coercion to satisfy another's desires, and believed that under socialism or communism the individual would be enslaved to the whole community rather than to a particular master, and it means not whether his master a single person or society, social Darwinism, for many, the name of Herbert Spencer would be virtually synonymous with social Darwinism, a social theory that applies the law of the survival of the fittest to society. Humanitarian impulses had to be resisted as nothing should be allowed to interfere with nature's laws, including the social struggle for existence. Spencer's association with social Darwinism might have its origin in a specific interpretation of his support for competition. Whereas in biology the competition of various organisms can result in the death of a species or organism, the kind of competition Spencer advocated is closer to the one used by economists, where competing individuals or firms improve the well-being of the rest of society. Spencer viewed private charity positively so long as it did not encourage the procreation of the unworthy, as he believed in voluntary association and informal care as opposed to using government machinery. Focusing on the form as well as the content of Spencer's synthetic philosophy, it has recently been identified as the paradigmatic case of social Darwinism, understood as a politically motivated metaphysic very different in both form and motivation from Darwinist science. General influence, while most philosophers fail to achieve much of a following outside the academy of their professional peers, by the 1870s and 1880s Spencer had achieved an unparalleled popularity as the sheer volume of his sales indicate. He was probably the first, and possibly the only, philosopher in history to sell over a million copies of his works during his own lifetime. In the United States, where pirated editions were still commonplace, his authorized publisher, Appleton, sold 368,755 copies between 1860 and 1903. This figure did not differ much from his sales in his native Britain, and once editions in the rest of the world are added in the figure of a million copies seems like a conservative estimate. As William James remarked, Spencer enlarged the imagination, and set free the speculative mind of countless doctors, engineers, and lawyers, of many physicists and chemists, and of thoughtful laymen generally. The aspect of his thought that emphasized individual self-improvement found a ready audience in the skilled working class. Spencer's influence among leaders of thought was also immense, though it was most often expressed in terms of their reaction to, and repudiation of, his ideas. As his American follower John Fiske observed, Spencer's ideas were to be found running like the weft through all the warp of Victorian thought. Such varied thinkers as Henry Sidgwick, T. H. Green, G. E. Moore, William James, Henri Bergson, and a Pamel Mild Durkheim defined their ideas in relation to his. Durkheim's division of labor and society is to a very large extent an extended debate with Spencer, from whose sociology, many commentators now agree, 
Durkheim borrowed extensively. In post-1863 uprising Poland, many of Spencer's ideas became integral to the dominant fin de siècle ideology, Polish positivism. The leading Polish writer of the period, Bolesai Pras, hailed Spencer as the Aristotle of the 19th century, and adopted Spencer's metaphor of society as organism, giving it a striking poetic presentation in his 1884 micro-story, Mold of the Earth, and highlighting the concept in the introduction to his most universal novel, Pharaoh. The early 20th century was hostile to Spencer. Soon after his death, his philosophical reputation went into a sharp decline. Half a century after his death, his work was dismissed as a parody of philosophy, and the historian Richard Hofstadter called him the metaphysician of the homemade intellectual, and the prophet of the cracker barrel agnostic. Nonetheless, Spencer's thought had penetrated so deeply into the Victorian age that his influence did not disappear entirely. In recent years, much more positive estimates have appeared, as well as a still highly negative estimate. Political influence, despite his reputation as a social Darwinist, Spencer's political thought has been open to multiple interpretations. His political philosophy could both provide inspiration to those who believed that individuals were masters of their fate, who should brook no interference from a meddling state, and those who believed that social development required a strong central authority. In Lochner v. New York, conservative justices of the United States Supreme Court could find inspiration in Spencer's writings for striking down a New York law limiting the number of hours a baker could work during the week, on the ground that this law restricted liberty of contract. Arguing against the majorities holding that a right to free contract is implicit in the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. wrote. The Fourteenth Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. Spencer has also been described as a quasi-anarchist, as well as an outright anarchist. Marxist theorist Georgi Plekhanov, in his 1909 book Anarchism and Socialism, labeled Spencer a conservative anarchist. Spencer's ideas became very influential in China and Japan largely because he appealed to the reformers' desire to establish a strong nation-state with which to compete with the Western powers. His thought was introduced by the Chinese scholar Yen Fu, who saw his writings as a prescription for the reform of the Qing state. Spencer also influenced the Japanese westernizer Tokitomi Soho, who believed that Japan was on the verge of transitioning from a militant society to an industrial society and needed to quickly jettison all things Japanese and take up Western ethics and learning. He also corresponded with Kanako Kentaro, warning him of the dangers of imperialism. Savaka writes in his Inside the Enemy Camp, about reading all of Spencer's works, of his great interest in them, of their translation into Marathi, and their influence on the likes of Tylak and Agarka, and the affectionate sobriquet given to him in Maharashtra Euro Harb Hat Pens. Influence on literature, Spencer also exerted a great influence on literature and rhetoric. His 1852 essay, The Philosophy of Style, explored a growing trend of formalist approaches to writing. Highly focused on the proper placement and ordering of the parts of an English sentence, he created a guide for effective composition. Spencer's aim was to free prose writing from as much friction and inertia as possible so that the reader would not be slowed by strenuous deliberations concerning the proper context and meaning of a sentence. Spencer argued that it is the writer's ideal to sow present ideas that they may be apprehended with the least possible mental effort by the reader. He argued that by making the meaning as readily accessible as possible, the writer would achieve the greatest possible communicative efficiency. This was accomplished, according to Spencer, by placing all the subordinate clauses objects and phrases before the subject of a sentence so that, when readers reached a subject, they had all the information they needed to completely perceive its significance. While the overall influence that the philosophy of style had on the field of rhetoric was not as far-reaching as his contribution to other fields, Spencer's voice lent authoritative support to formalist views of rhetoric. Spencer also had an influence on literature as many novelists and short story authors came to address his ideas in their work. George Eliot, Leo Tolstoy, Thomas Hardy, George Bernard Shaw, Bola Sy Pras, Abraham Cohan, D. H. Lawrence, Machado de Assis, Richard Austin Freeman, 
and Jorge Luis Borges all referenced Spencer. Arnold Bennett greatly praised First Principles, and the influence it had on Bennett may be seen in his many novels. Jack London went so far as to create a character, Martin Eden, a staunch Spencerian. It has also been suggested that the character of Ershinin in Anton Chekhov's play The Three Sisters is a dedicated Spencerian. H. G. Wells used Spencer's ideas as a theme in his novella, The Time Machine, employing them to explain the evolution of man into two species. It is perhaps the best testimony to the influence of Spencer's beliefs and writings that his reach was so diverse. He influenced not only the administrators who shaped their society's inner workings, but also the artists who helped shape those societies' ideals and beliefs. In Rudyard Kipling's novel Kim, the Anglophile Bengali spy Hari Babu is an admirer of Herbert Spencer and quotes him to comic effect, they are, of course, dematerialized phenomena. Spencer says, I am good enough Herbert Spencerian, I trust, to meet little thing like death, which is all in my fate, you know. He thanked all the gods of Hindustan, and Herbert Spencer, that there remained some valuables to steal. Primary sources, papers of Herbert Spencer in Senate House Library, University of London, most of Spencer's books are available online, on the proper sphere of government, social statics, or, the conditions essential to human happiness specified, and the first of them developed, the right to ignore the state, chapter 19 of the first edition of Social Statics, p. Social Statics, abridged and revised. A Theory of Population, Principles of Psychology, first edition, issued in one volume, Education, System of Synthetic Philosophy, in ten volumes, first principles ISBN 0-89875-795-9, Principles of Biology, in two volumes, volume IA Euro Part 1, The Data of Biology. Part 2, The Inductions of Biology. Part 3, The Evolution of Life. Appendices, Volume 2 A Euro Part 4, Morphological Development. Part 5, Physiological Development. Part 6, Laws of Multiplication. Appendices. Principles of Psychology, in two volumes, Volume IA Euro Part 1, The Data of Psychology. Part 2, The Inductions of Psychology. Part 3, General Synthesis. Part 4, Special Synthesis. Part 5, Physical Synthesis. Appendix, Volume 2 A Euro Part 6, Special Analysis. Part 7, General Analysis. Part 8, Congruities. Part 9, Corollaries. Principles of Sociology, in three volumes, Volume IA Euro Part 1, Data of Sociology. Part 2, Inductions of Sociology. Part 3, Domestic Institutions, Volume 2 A Euro Part 4, Ceremonial Institutions. Part 5, Political Institutions. Part 6, published here in some editions Ecclesiastical Institutions, Volume 3 A Euro Part 6, published here in some editions Ecclesiastical Institutions. Part 7, Professional Institutions. Part 8, Industrial Institutions. References the Principles of Ethics, in two volumes, Volume IA Euro Part 1, The Data of Ethics. Part 2, The Inductions of Ethics. Part 3, The Ethics of Individual Life. References, Volume 2 A Euro Part 4, The Ethics of Social Life, Justice. Part 5, The Ethics of Social Life, Negative Beneficence. Part 6, The Ethics of Social Life, Positive Beneficence. Appendices. The Study of Sociology, an Autobiography, in two volumes, see also Spencer, Herbert. An Autobiography D. Appleton and Company A, V. 1 Life and Letters of Herbert Spencer by David Duncan, V. 2 Life and Letters of Herbert Spencer by David Duncan, Descriptive Sociology. All Groups of Sociological Facts, Parts 1 Euro 8, Classified and Arranged by Spencer, Compiled and abstracted by David Duncan, Richard Shepping, and James Collier. Essay Collections, Illustrations of Universal Progress, A Series of Discussions, The Man vs. the State, Essays, Scientific, Political, and Speculative, 
in three volumes, Volume 1 Volume 2, The Origin and Function of Music, The Physiology of Laughter, and Others, Volume 3. Various Fragments, Facts and Comments, Great Political Thinkers, Philosophers Critiques, Herbert Spencer, An Estimate and Review by Josiah Royce. Lectures on the Ethics of T. H. Green, Mr. Herbert Spencer, and J. Martino by Henry Sidgwick. Spencer Smashing at Washington by Lester F. Ward. A Perplexed Philosopher by Henry George. A Few Words with Mr. Herbert Spencer by Paul Lafargue. Remarks on Spencer's Definition of Mind as Correspondence by William James. See also, Contributions to Liberal Theory, Geolibertarianism, Notes. References. External links, Biographical, Herbert Spencer Entry by David Weinstein in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, February 27, 2008, Herbert Spencer Entry in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy by William Sweet, Review Materials for Studying Herbert Spencer, Herbert Spencer at Find a Grave, Sources, Works by Herbert Spencer at the Online Library of Liberty, Works by and about Herbert Spencer at Internet Archive, Works by Herbert Spencer at Project Gutenberg, Works by or about Herbert Spencer in Libraries, On Moral Education, Reprinted in Left and Right, A Journal of Libertarian Thought, First Principles Electronic Text Center, University of Virginia Library. First Principles Online, The Right to Ignore the State by Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer, The Defamation Continues of Vindication by Roderick T. Long.